Good afternoon to all and welcome back to the Seamless Philippines Banking Channel. My name is Kathleen as your host. So before I introduce our next panel session for the day, just a quick reminder, be involved in the conversation. If you are watching on a computer screen, just look over on the right side and you will see the live discussion area where you can chat with other attendees and drop your questions to our panelists. And if you are watching on a mobile device, then the live discussion area is just underneath. Our topic is titled Banking the Unbanked in the Philippines with our expert panelists from Cebuana Lulier Bank, Lipa Bank, Credit Information Corporation, and Finscore. And this is being moderated by the, by the Head of Strategy and Transformation of Etika Philippines, Gladys Pascual. Over to you, Gladys. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to the Banking the Unbanked panel discussion. First of all, thank you to Seamless uh, Philippines for putting together this virtual virtual event and, and inviting us to be part of the, this discussion. Uh, we are here to discuss the importance of banking and bank, and to put it simply, financial inclusion. Just a short background before we engage the panelists. Um, in 2017, World Bank released its Global Findex database. It's actually the world's biggest database that really reports on how adults save, how do they make payments. And in this report, the Philippines rank among the lowest in, in Southeast Asia on almost all financial inclusion indicators. It says that only 34% of Filipino adults, or one out of three, to put it more simply, has an account with a formal institution. Comparing this versus our neighbors uh, like um, Indonesia, which is 49% penetration, 82% in Thailand, and 85% in Malaysia. Uh, BSP very recently also released a similar report and showed that account ownership is actually almost twice higher in the top social eco class. And uh, employed individuals are twice most likely to own an account than those who are unemployed. So with these numbers, uh, BSP is really pushing um, for financial inclusion as a priority agenda and targets to reach 70% in 2023. So what a big number. And, and so is this really doable? Is this something that we can reach in 2023? And how does, impact, how does financial inclusion impact you and me? And, and even, of course, just the regular guy, the regular guy who makes her coffee, the, the guy who delivers her package, and everyone, you and, and me and the family. So in today's panel discussion, we will talk about banking the unbank and, and we will focus on, on some key topics. One is so we will start off by understanding what are the barriers, why only one out of three Filipinos are, are currently back. Well, what are these barriers and, and what can we do in the private and, and uh, public sector to address this? Secondly, what are the benefits of pushing financial inclusion and, and what does it mean to a regular guy? Third, uh, what are the alternatives to banking and, and are these alternatives better to push rapid adoption? Let's talk about some new names, like cryptocurrency, cloud-based technology, are, are all of this, how this is helping us push and improve our financial inclusion numbers. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, the distinguished members of the panel. And then I know it will be a very rich and insightful discussion because it, it's a good mix and, and it's a good mix of panelists. We have representatives from the public sector, from the private sector, and even from the technology sector. So uh, let me introduce the panelists one by one. Um, first, um, he was appointed by President Duterte as a public sector director and elected by the board as the president CEO of the Credit Information Corporation since 2020. Since 2014, he was a technical and executive assistant to the SEC chairpersons while functioning as the SEC liaison officer to the CIC. Uh, in 2019, he was designated as a public sector director to the CIC together with representatives from the Banco Central and the Insurance Commission, while also chairing the CIC's risk committee. So let us all welcome our first panelist, Attorney Ben Joshua Baltasar. Hi, Ben. Hi, Gladys. Uh, thank good you for afternoon. that introduction. Yeah, good afternoon to everyone. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be invited to your panel. 
So um, I am the PCEO of the Credit Information Corporation, which is the country's sole public registry. Um, we have a database right now of around 29 million unique data subjects or borrowers oh, wow. spanning um, over 100 million contracts. Um, currently, we do have 600 submitting entities. So these are banks, uh, lending finance companies, co-ops, and um, microfinance uh, institutions as well. So uh, I look forward to a rich discussion with my peers here today. And hopefully, we can probably shine a light on the initiatives right now um, towards banking the unbanked. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, and welcome. Uh, our next panelist is the director, um, executive vice president, and chief of operating officer of Lipa Bank Incorporated. He is also the director of Rural Bank Association of the Philippines, a fellow of Foundation for Economic Freedom. He's been, he's really an expert, 25 years in rural banking, and before that, he's been, he has done, he's handled information technology, human resource, operations management, credit and remedial accounts management. What don't you do, Johnson? So let us all welcome Johnson Marada Mello. Good morning, good afternoon, sir. Hi, good afternoon, Miss Gladys. Uh, it's glad to be here at a uh, seamless uh, discussion on uh, financial inclusion. It's a pleasure and an honor also. Uh, I hope that with this discussion, we can share some uh, information, uh, particularly to our uh, unbanked sectors, as well as those players for this financial inclusion. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Our third panelist is currently the president of Cebuana Luvillier Bank. Um, so Buana Luvillier Bank is one of the top rural banks in the Philippines, servicing more than 5 million formerly, formerly unserved under back clients in the Philippines. So it's really has a major role in, in this topic. No? So the bank was recently recognized as one of the 2021 outstanding BSP stakeholders and was also awarded as Best Rural Cooperative Bank Philippines by the Asian Banking and Finance Rural Banking Awards 2021. He was also the former board director of the Rural Bank Association of the Philippines. Let us all welcome Mr. Dennis Valdez. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having uh, me here as one of your panelists. Uh, again, uh, and as I always say, you know, uh, banking the underbanked and unbanked is really close to the heart of Cebuana Lulier Bank. And, you know, uh, I would really like to get into discussion, this, this discussion on how we can further improve this no? uh, together with both you know um, the private and the public sector working together uh, in this this very uh, great endeavor so again thank you for having me welcome Dennis and lastly but definitely not the least he's the country manager and chief strategy officer of FinScore Inc which is an alternative credit scoring and data analytics company in the Philippines. This company has recently been awarded as the best fintech startup of the year in the Philippines by the Asset AAA Awards. This guy oversees the operations, sales, marketing, and project management of the business and is actively helping in bridging the gap between the bank population and financial institutions in Southeast Asia through FinScore's alternative data credit scoring services and technology. Let us all welcome Christo Georgia. Hi, Christo. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Gladys, for the introduction. It's an absolute honor to represent FinScore within this panel. Uh, our company is uh, Philippines first and focusing 100% our efforts on the Philippines market for the time being. We've been active for a little over three years. We've so far distributed around 5 million telco credit scores, and uh, we're serving a little bit over 25 financial institutions in the country, and we're looking to uh, hopefully give our modest contribution towards increasing these numbers even further and presenting and being the gateway basically towards financial inclusion for the, for the unbanked in the country. Thank you very much for the introduction. Okay, welcome, Crystal. So as I told you, it is a very interesting mix of panelists. We have it's a well represented. You have representatives from the public, from the private, and of course from the technology sector. So, without further ado, let let's start it off. Let's start the discussion on, on banking, then bank, or very simply financial inclusion. So, 
first question I, I did mention a while ago some some stats and, and what we're seeing is that one only one out of three Filipinos are currently have a formal relationship with a financial institution. In, in your view, um, well, what are the major barriers that actually affect our access to financial system? I mean, I, I, I've done my reading and, and I see some some reasons, but I'd like to get your, your views on this. So would like to start it off. Uh, maybe I can start first, uh, Gladys. Okay, Dennis, yeah. Well, uh... You know, when we launched our our product, the micro savings account, uh, the goal really for for our bank or for Cebuana Lulier Group in general was really to provide access, you know, to formal financial services for um, you know the, the for every Filipino. Um, what we noticed, and actually this supports the data of BSP, it's not that you know uh, the Filipinos cannot save. It's actually the access to to having these financial services. Uh, previously, uh, before we launched this, uh, and you know, technology wasn't as good as what we have right now, no, in terms of telco services and all of that. But back then, when we launched, um, the there was a lot of areas wherein uh, areas were not covered by you know by banks. Uh, and and that led to uh, and, and the beauty of this was that in 2017 2018 the BSP came out with you know two cornerstone uh, circulars which actually helped us you know spread this out. So the first one was uh, they allowed uh, banks to outsource their um, their account opening, deposit and withdrawal functions to to third parties. And the second one was to allow the basic deposit account. So with the basic deposit account, uh, this addresses now the issue of uh, uh, the amount that a person can save and uh, also the documentary requirements because that was the, the next two barriers that, uh, that uh, the average Filipino had no? or the underbanked or unbanked. Uh, so first it would be location. The second would be the amount to be placed. So we addressed that by just having a zero maintaining balance. And the third one was just to have, you know, uh, they just needed one ID. In fact, they didn't even need to have a formal ID like the government IDs. You know, even a barangay clearance, um, you know, uh, what other IDs that they can provide, uh, secondary IDs, that's acceptable to us. So in our bank, for example, or our cash agency agreement with our sister company, Sabuana Lulier, I think we... We accept like I think about thirty IDs, if I'm not mistaken. Wow, okay. So that basically addressed, mm -hmm. you know, um, them having their first foray in financial services, and I think that was also supported by the BSP study you mentioned about the inclusion, uh, the financial inclusion study mm -hmm. of the 2017 and 2019 done mm -hmm. by the BSP, and we are pretty much aligned in that aspect. Ooh, okay, good to know. Any more? Um... Ben would like to share from the government sector yeah, your views on this. Yeah, sure thing, Gladys. And maybe to um, build uh, from what Dennis said, because um, I think he uh, kind of skipped a crucial phase um, in the uh, in mentioning the BSP's initiatives, which, which was really to check at the behavior of um, borrowers. So to your question about why um, it's been an uphill battle, to uh, get the unbanked banked. Uh, you mentioned a statistic earlier about one out of three. Mm -hmm. uh, if I recall, if you stretch that horizon to the past, I would say 30 years, that's actually already a vast improvement. Uh, before, I think um, when I started looking at the data, we, we would like see um, penetration rates of less than uh, 10%. And I think fundamentally, we have to look at the habits of the borrowers, which is the idea that well, um, everyone needs credit. I mean, whether you're rich, you're poor, you're self-employed or employed, um, credit is a necessity in order for you to bridge interruptions in your income. And of course, you can't expect your expenses to necessarily time with your, um, you know, when your income comes in. So the idea there is that it's not so much that these people have not, you know, availed of credit. It's just that they've availed of it from informal sources. So surveys have always revealed that, you know, if you ask 
a, a random person, where do you get your credit? They usually say their relatives, maybe the neighborhood. Uh, five, park. six. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, we've had experience with that in my former life in the SEC. And the idea there is why are they availing of these sources which can charge higher interest versus banks or more formal, secure sources? And the answer, I think, is very simple because these informal sources go to them. They make it easy for the credit to be deployed to them. They don't need an ID. Um, they have the resources to your, to your comment earlier about five, six. You actually have uh, a mobile lender going around that area. You don't expect banks to do that, right? So it's a case where in, I guess, the reason why we can't formalize these borrowers is because the informal sector uh, makes it easy for them to access credit through their channels. So I think this is what Dennis was trying to say. We're trying to lower the barriers, the requirements, applying essentially the tactics of these informal lenders um, in order for them to be onboarded to formal um, um, lenders. So of course we do require KYC. So there's still a minimum standard to be uh, upheld and maybe we can discuss that later because the KYC right now is going to be at the cheapest way uh, possible because of the fail sys or the government ID that's being rolled out. So if that's going to be the universal KYC basis, then we actually put banks and informal lenders at equal footing in terms of KYC. So that's, I guess, you know, the, I, my, my practical sense of why we are having um, this challenge of banking the unbanked. Okay, well, interesting. But, but I just want to understand also, uh, Sir Johnson, um, aside from the, the reasons mentioned by Dennis and Ben, how about, how about I mean, I would think, and, and there's really the factor of lack of funds among some people not being able to, is that still, I mean, I, I remember Dennis mentioning that they have lowered the barrier, but what do you think about this, uh, Sir Johnson? Is this still a major factor that, that contributes to this situation that we have now in the Philippines? But actually, uh, I could answer that based on my experience in uh, when I was young. Almost uh, everybody in the family has an account because there's someone from the bank who go around the community collecting deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the value of savings during that then, back then, you know, around the 1980s, uh, uh, every family is encouraged to open an account. So even if you're just saving every Christmas because uh, after collecting uh, gifts from, from friends and relatives, uh, every children, every child is uh, encouraged to deposit uh, in their bank account. Mm -hmm. Then later on, uh, when I joined banking in 1994, uh, there are still collectors going around. And then later on, after the Asian financial crisis, the regulations on opening an account and uh, mobile collectors were restricted. So probably that's one reason why uh, the value of savings uh, for his family has waned. And uh, with the stricter rules in opening an account, then it became very hard for an individual to get an account. So you will notice in the financial inclusion survey, most of them are saving at home. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because they, they cannot just uh, simply go to a bank and then open an account. But with the uh, loosening up of uh, these restrictions and with the help of technology, I think uh, it will soon uh, go back to the, the uh, trend of, uh, of, of savings, uh, considering the access of, of even, even a schooler uh, can, can uh, already open an account and then uh, join in the banking system. Okay, thank you. Well, well, we've seen the, I've uh, shared earlier the numbers as we compare versus our neighboring ASEAN uh, countries, like higher Malaysia, Thailand, and they have much higher numbers. So I'm, I'm curious to know, do you think that there are any cultural differences in, in how people think and how people view savings? Does, does our culture of being more family-oriented uh, play as a factor in, in in, in our in, in all of this what do you think like 
Crystal, I'd, I'd like to know, you, you've been working and I, I know that you've worked in Southeast Asia for quite a while. What, what are your observations on this one? Yeah, thank you, Gladys. Um, uh, I've, I have indeed, uh, I, I have looked at this manner from someone that's basically not been born in the country, but I've spent the good part of the last decade in the Philippines. So I've seen with my own eyes the uh, many, many improvements that have happened in the country over time. And uh, there, there are something that is really sometimes underappreciated if we're looking at just the raw figures within, uh, within a survey. Um, from an external standpoint or from a foreigner standpoint, the country has some obvious barriers, like there are geographical barriers, it's an archipelago, so physically serving the population is a challenge from any standpoint, not only for financial services, but for any type of service, really. Uh, there, there are technological barriers and they are such pretty much everywhere all, all over the world in the sense that uh, basically every sector is being disrupted by technology and quite a lot of the traditional financial institutions are currently at some uh, somewhere midway their digital transformation journey which has no end it has a very definite definitive start but it has no end so that's that's another barrier for both uh, the institutions as well as from their kind of uh, uh, users or from from their consumer standpoint and uh, However, the biggest barrier that I've seen so far is, and where technology can play the biggest role, has probably been in terms of the access to information. Um, I can't really compare it uh, very much towards the surrounding Southeast Asian countries, but if we do a comparison, for example, with uh, Europe or with the US, whereby there's national ID systems, there's credit and income registries, private credit bureaus, penetration is quite high, open banking has started somewhere maybe over a, maybe almost a decade ago and at least in uh, from a regulatory standpoint all of this infrastructure is still being built in the philippines and the improvements on on every side of the spectrum i mean we've heard the attorney ben earlier the penetration and the quality of the cac over the the last couple of years have massively massively improved uh, the national id is being um, uh, rolled out right now, which is another initiative that is going to improve this. This is where technology is going to play a role, combining the access to these different data sources and uh, turning them into essentially information that allows financial institutions to serve individuals. That's that's where that's where I think technology can make the can make uh, can play a decisive role. Definitely, I totally agree that the technology plays a very important role in, in financial inclusion. I'd like to I'd like to read off some some questions from the chat box. Really, just building on what we have discussed earlier. So, um, Dennis and Ben, you did mention that really our trust is to lower the barriers and make it easy for people to 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 get into a financial institution. But there is a question: uh, How come other employees? I mean, really, they have the financial documents to show it who is earning, earning way above the minimum wage, but they are denied in getting a credit card. Also freelancers also who are earning more. So I think these are just some of the questions. Who would like to answer that? Um, well, if we're talking of opening an account to commercial bank, uh, one is the, uh, the minimum amount of deposit becomes a barrier. Mm -hmm. and uh, the required maintaining balance as well as the charges below maintaining and the dormancy fees. You know? Those yeah. are but this sir, is really for credit card. I just want to just interject that the question is really how come people who can show financial capability who are employed are, are, are denied to get the credit card? I think that, that's the question, sir. Uh, well, Probably because they have no experience on uh, uh, credit uh, transactions yet. And uh, the scoring system of this uh, commercial bank provided credit cards uh, cannot show any uh, 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 successful uh, information to, to be able to provide the approving authorities of, of these banks to grant uh, credit limit to this uh, particular set of uh, employees. 
Yeah, but, but if the person is a newbie, obviously the, the doesn't have the, the background as you're saying for, for this. But how can a person actually start off when you you don't have the history, as you said, uh, Sir Johnson? Any any views on this? Uh, that, that's the problem with uh, a, a credit scoring system that is uh, designed in a box, meaning oh, okay. uh, the, the decision is based on what is provided by the, system, the credit scoring system. So the, the approving authority has no leeway on how they will uh, adjust their uh, 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 approving system uh, mm -hmm. or how we call it, uh, the, the, the credit uh, decisions mm -hmm. on whether they will accept or not the uh, credit card applicant. Okay. Any more views on this? Uh... Uh, Gladys, yeah, I, I'd just like to chime in. So um, what uh, sure. Johnson actually mentioned is uh, the typical chicken and egg problem, similar mm -hmm. to employment. They yeah. want to hire somebody with experience, but in order for you to get experience, you have to be hired. So the same yeah. logic applies to a credit card. Mm -hmm. What Johnson is actually referring to is payment history. So in order for a credit card company to um, be comfortable issuing your credit card, they want to see that you can meet your past payment obligations as they come due. So that's actually what mainly CIC does in terms of collecting um, payment information. Now, you are referring to this conundrum really with those, um, um, let's say, young professionals or young yeah. business owners or those that have not been onboarded in the formal financial sector for quite a while, but actually are, you know, um, stable, they have yeah. solid income, they have good uh, uh, credentials. And um, that's something actually that um, we are working on with a lot of partners. Um, one of them would be FinTech Alliance, which is the idea that um, maybe you can start off onboarding these uh, new to credit candidates with a lower credit limit and then allowing them to build it gradually so that you, you know, both the borrower and the lender get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, because you cited like these questions, uh, I have a brother-in-law that actually fits the demographic you're saying. He's young, he has a master's degree from New York. He was uh, hired by a multinational company. And when he applied for a credit card, it was denied. Mm -hmm. And eventually I think he got one because the bank that he applied to gave him kind of like a starter credit card with a far lower credit limit. I told them, don't be insulted by it. At least they gave you a chance. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what, um, you know, the kind of innovations we need to also see from the credit card companies in the banking sector. Now, I understand, especially under this pandemic, and we have the stats to bear it out that, you know, um, repayments for credit cards have taken a hit. But I, I hope that credit card companies um, do not lose faith in the Filipino borrower. Um, you know, some people are still thriving under this pandemic. And if you want to sustain your lending operations, you have to give people a chance. Um, at the very least, they can pull a credit report from us. If you're new to credit, you probably won't have a record with us. And that's actually a good sign for the person that is going to assess your application because similar to like an NBI clearance, like an NBI clearance is one of those clearances that's positive when it's negative, right? <laughs> so if you're new to credit and then you, they pull your credit report from us and you don't have a record, it kind of reinforces the notion to them that indeed you are new to credit, you don't have any other exposures, and they can apply the appropriate um, onboarding credit mm -hmm. card program to you. So, so that's just my two cents on this on this uh, question. Okay. So, just the advice is just try and try, <laughs> try to apply with many financial and, and just get a starter kit, right? Uh, ben, just to kick off that, that financial history. Um, Gladys, and, if I if I may also, I sure, think. Sure, um, uh, and and both of them hit it on the nail. You know, I, I think that's that's basically the conundrum, and I think that is where you know um, um, you have the traditional bank setup, wherein you have to have credit history before we could be able to to provide loans, right? Um, and then here we are also, and that is where you know um, we. I'm, I I also have the perspective of the bank, so don't don't get me wrong, okay? Yeah. But 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 definitely, you know, that's where you know. Um, Better technology, better, you know, uh, alternative data uh, comes into play, right? Um, and Ben was right. Definitely, you know, um, if if on a typical bank setup, 
you uh you know you do a credit check if it doesn't come out there's no credit history maybe he may not be able to get a credit or you just get a nominal amount that that's usually the case right but i think with what alternative data is also coming out um all these um uh, fintechs or these alternative data source i think you know uh, my co panelist uh crystal could could obviously expound later on right this is where we try to draw on also an alternative data so probably you know um um telco uh habits what they use in their airtime uh are we talking about let's say for example utilities payments you know um on the side of how we will do it also or how we're doing it is um and the good thing is that we were able to get this wealth data we have five million clients you know we get to see also their movements of their account mm -hmm. we not have a good history but we get to see their movements already we get to see the sources and uses of their funds so that already i am able to develop a customer journey i'm, I'm able to develop you know a a um a uh, uh you know uh, basically mm -hmm. a product or something that journey and that's why you know adding to what ben said earlier that's why you know we focused first on getting the accounts because we want to develop that that uh, the transaction uh history of the clients we get to even if they don't yet but we see oh my regular payments they have regular payments here they do you know they, they purchase here regularly so yeah you get a, a sense already of what what they're doing i mean it's a it's a bigger discussion of big mm -hmm. data crunching all these yeah. numbers mm -hmm. but but maybe i i think our co-panelists would be uh, more than happy to discuss it in detail yeah. Yeah, interesting. And I think you touched on, on one topic that we would like mm -hmm. to talk also about what are alternative ways in actually credit scoring. I mean, the traditional way, as, as we said, is really you have to show some financial activity. But but what are the alternative ways of, of credit scoring? And, and maybe, Crystal, you can, can share a bit about this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. I'd be, I'd be glad to expand a little bit our organization and my personal thoughts on that matter. Uh, maybe first, when we talk about credit scoring, obviously, our my co-panelists have outlined many of the factors that feed into a traditional type of credit score, such as, for example, the social demographics factors, such as past employment history, such as repayment behavior from credit cards, from loans for uh, essentially any sort of history with the traditional financial institutions. So when we talk about alternatives, it's important to uh, think about it, not that these are alternative means in the sense of uh, entirely irrelevant or basically entirely separate alternatives. They are just non-traditional. So they don't rely on traditional data in order to be able to make to produce the same type of outcome. So they are very much supposed to be used in combination with the traditional information rather than as a separate viewpoint because the combination of the traditional information and the um, alternative information can produce a full 360 degree view of the identity of the potential applicant or borrower. So in that sense, if we take, for example, um, a telecom, uh, telecom data, here is, here is how we thought about it. Okay, there, there are individuals that currently don't have a bank account. They, uh, if that's the case, then where do they have existing reputation that they can tap onto? And fact of the matter is in the Philippines, as well as in pretty much every other country in the world, everyone has a mobile phone. So they usually start using their mobile phones. Some, sometimes, I mean, I'm a millennial, but the next generations probably start using them from pretty much two, three years old. Uh, so there is meaningful information already captured on the uh, mobile network operator that can be used as a proxy for the borrower's loyalty, for their um, creditworthiness, for their propensity to default or not when they're given a loan. And this is basically uh, the bridge, the gateway, the, the door opener, so to say, uh, for uh, individuals to utilize that sort of reputation from a different ecosystem 
and translate it into their new type of relationship with the new ecosystem with a financial institution. And of course, not right off the bat get uh, 500,000 pesos per month credit card limit, mm -hmm. but maybe be able to uh, get a quick loan or a starter credit product or any credit product that's basically going to allow them to prove their credit worthiness, get them mm -hmm. inside the CIC, and uh, from there on it becomes much, much easier. Oh, thank you. So focusing on CIC, you mentioned CIC. Uh, there is a question from, from the chat. Uh, well, what sectors or industries are not yet part of the credit information center? Are, are there sectors not yet part of this, uh, Ben? Oh, okay. Thanks for the question. So um, we, we are the Credit Information Corporation. Um, our mandate actually um, is very broad because uh, any entity that uh, extends credit or issues loans, whether their primary regulators, the BSP, the SEC, the Insurance Commission, the Cooperative Development Authority, even the NTC for telcos, uh, they are under our um, ambit. So in terms of sectors, um, we do have representatives from all of those major segments, universal banks, commercial banks, uh, thrift banks, rural banks, any bank you can think of, uh, microfinance, cooperatives, um, lending companies and finance companies which are regulated by the SEC. Um, maybe so I'll just focus on where we are trying to gain some traction, which would probably be the telcos or the utilities. Okay, the telcos. Um, so just to build on what Christo said earlier, um, uh, alternative data, I think, um, emphasizes non-payments uh, data. Because the idea there, and if you look at credit history, I mean, credit reporting, which has spanned like a century already, in the West, it focuses on payments history. The idea there is if you're obligated to pay something like a loan, you, you, the um, banks can assess your credit worthiness for future access to funds based on the fact that you have a good track record of payment. So it's like the logic is if you paid your debt before, then I believe you will pay your debt in the future. So that's kind okay. of like the baseline logic. Mm -hmm. So. For banks, for those that ex ex uh, extend loans, it's not a problem. For telcos and utilities, the analogy is a little bit modified because the idea there is these utilities or telcos, especially like postpaid for, for cell phones, is that they render the service first and then you pay afterwards. So naturally the idea there is if you don't pay after they render service, it's kind of just like a default in a loan, right? So the logic there is we do want to gain more headway in uh, telcos and utilities. I think we have one utility that's onboarded and one telco that's on the way. Uh, there's not a lot of telcos, so we hope that when that one player comes in, mm -hmm. uh, the rest will follow. There is a follow. Okay, so, that, that's um, good to know. So in terms of coverage, we, we hope to get there. And we do have that, um, uh, I would say, the, the uh, special power to also declare uh, if in the future there's like a new form of... Um, you know, credit lending entity. We can we can also declare that as covered, based on our um, mandate. Because once again, it's more about the activity, not so much the entity that extends the credit, mm -hmm. entity, but it's the activity. Okay. Um, if the activity is being done, then they should be reporting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um. But but yeah, I think the the last few questions are really focused on people who have a better financial. Uh, standing in, in the society. I think the bigger challenge now is, is right, going down the roads to a regular job. No? So really, I think that's where the challenge is. And and, and I think uh, we would like to know and we'd like to understand uh, what are the key initiatives that, that you are doing in your own area to actually push uh, and improve our financial inclusion numbers, uh, really, particularly for the regular job, for the regular guy, who doesn't have all that documentation and can, can you share some of these initiatives that um to to, to, to us um maybe you can start off dennis as you are really in in this uh, uh, okay. segment currently yeah okay well um we we've actually designed this financial wellness program okay um we're just not start stopping uh with financial inclusion meaning just getting them in you yeah. know, and and I think that's where uh, the tricky part gets in, you know, because we what we're trying to do is also try to educate the client, meaning 
just because you have a savings account and that's it already you know you need to know how to save you know you need to know how to use your funds how to maximize your investments later on building enough you know um uh for you to 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 be able to get let's say a credit facility later on the, um get or or protecting yourself later on in case of any eventuality you also get let's say an insurance a micro insurance or so so that's pretty much the financial wellness program that we're that we've developed and 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 then what we're trying to to put it all together because especially for the market that Cebuana Luwalier is known for which is servicing the CD and mm -hmm. e market it's really educating them it's really telling them you know it, it's guiding them not telling them but guiding them no uh that uh, um there is a transition here and i think that's why we were successful we've always tried to handhold our clients from you know rel and, and introducing them to very relevant um financial services so um you know making them understand that you know when you have savings later on you can use that for a rainy day so is insurance mm -hmm. later on you know maybe you should learn how to segregate your funds so that you know you have your savings and you have something to use uh, on your day day-to-day -day requirements later on you know um you, you we feel that this this client is already you know um because of their history because of their 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 activities their behavior actually you know they already can be provided a credit facility so so that that's that's the space that we're working on another thing that we've seen really and that's the reason why you know um uh we've launched our connection with banknet we also have union pay later on we'll we'll be also adding um other other you know international schemes and at the same time also um just yesterday we were part of the pilot no, of um the qr uh php to f we were one of the pilot banks um that uh could now facilitate fund transfer using qr uh, using our app so um that and that's another thing that our clients require now and that's what we see mobility payments funds transfer because um uh that also builds you know uh, uh the the activities of the client showing them that there are more efficient ways to 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 transfer you don't need to have cash anymore you know you can already do a fund transfer i can have a qr code i can give a micro merchant a qr code and you know anyone with a qr ph uh, uh, qr can just you know uh use their app and pay already no need for cash contactless and everything very efficient you see mm -hmm. there's a transfer value already so that's what we're trying to introduce to our clients that's, that's what we're trying to to you know um uh, introduce them that there are more efficient ways of doing your financial services Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, but but I, I guess just to follow through on, on what you said, Dennis, yes. I, I know some people have this hesitancy to do yes. online transfer really because of data, data right. security. And, and right. maybe that's something that may one of you would like to say something. I mean, how can we how can we uh, assure our public that it, it's actually safe to to use uh, the online uh platforms and you don't need to have a printed uh receipt i mean that's really the culture that we have that some some thoughts on that um how, how do we how do we help and then you said then it's about education how do we help our public to be less scared of, of the of the, of the thing uh, okay. that, that some uh, data may be uh yeah that, that, that's, a good, that's a good question because i have friends you know who are actually senior officers of bigger banks you know and are still even you know afraid to do digital transactions you know um um it, it goes to show that there's really some hesitancy i mean it's really in our culture we see all the you know the scary stories that someone got hacked you know there was an uh you know a um uh an authorized usage of their account or there was a data breach of some sorts no? okay i think um part of part of what uh, is important is really education. I think really part of, of um, the reasons why accounts are getting compromised, let's not talk about the institutions first, let's talk about you know individuals, mm -hmm. is because they may uh, probably have fallen prey to you know, phishing activities. They may have, you know, they may have disclosed 
you know some personal information using their social media um so so those are the things that you know that it's a constant reminder actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um in i and I, i'd like to say you know that's where the bsp also comes in and they are you know uh, policing the banks ensuring that we have you know fin financial consumer um projects we have to ensure that we always remind our clients about the dangers of phishing you know um and and how to protect your account don't use the same passwords um you know at the same time uh we're also so they want to ensure that you know our systems are you know um are secure and we just don't deal with uh, no, no, um uh we just don't have any shoddy set okay um and that's the reason why probably we were able to get all these international uh all these uh in international schemes and uh, because we really make sure that we're up to standard in terms of uh, our in set that's great to know uh any more like to add to that uh, sir johnson <laughs> yes uh, well actually uh bsp has done a lot uh in uh securing these transactions. In fact, uh, they have created this uh, PP PPMI, the Philippine Payments uh, uh, Management Incorporated, uh, together with the, with the banks and uh, the central banks. They were able to set up this clearing system for those uh, digital transactions. And in fact, uh, the, the BSP has claimed that around uh, 160% increase in volume of transactions since 2019, you know, and around 61% in increase in uh, the total amount of uh, transactions, meaning that it has gaining ground already uh, mm -hmm. in the public. Probably the, the reason is but that uh, because of the pandemic, people yeah. was, able, was forced to experience <laughs> the digital transformation. And uh, even the financial system has to cope up with this trend. Otherwise, there will be a state. Uh, no, nobody will go to your bank anymore because <laughs> of the fear of a pandemic as well as the cost of transporting from your place to the bank. No? It's still uh, cost efficient to, to, to pay the uh, convenience fee rather than move out from your, <laughs> from your home, comfort of your home and then go to these uh, uh, branches and that uh, do your transactions. And uh, in the same manner, uh, I, I think that the BSP uh, is, is uh, moving forward to really uh, go into this, what we call uh, cash light economy. In fact, even the, the Senate has already moving also uh, mm -hmm. in, in uh, promoting this uh, digital payment uh, systems, uh, wherein eventually, the national government agencies, the GOCCs, and the LGUs will be mandated to accept and process uh, digital payments. Mm -hmm. And the DTI will soon be mandated to encourage small merchants to accept and process also these mm -hmm. uh, digital transactions. Um, the good thing is, as we go, we go on with this uh, transformation, technology becomes cheaper and accessible. Uh, the only problem that we have now is to make sure that our infrastructure can support these changes in the technology. So it's really, really close collaboration between sectors yes. and, and technology is very important. And, and as you said, I think that's one of the upsides of the pandemic. Now, people will actually force. It was a necessity yes. to, to go digital. So I think that's one of the good things that came out uh, of the pandemic. So. Time check, it, it's 12.50 and, and uh, almost just 10 minutes uh, to our closing time. Uh, and this time, I'd like to get some your closing remarks, just your, your, your final notes on, on uh, Banking Dan Bank and then before we actually officially close this panel discussion. We'd like to, I would like to start it off. Uh, Dennis, would you like to start it off? Like a minute to, to just... Give your final thoughts, and then I'll, I'll call. Next would be uh, Ben, and then Johnson, and then Crystal. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks, Gladys. Okay. Yes. Uh, again, I, I think uh, the the banking industry or the financial services industry in general 
is really working double time. I think they're very supportive of the initiatives of the BSP. If I recall um, the speech yesterday, they really uh, Go Governor Jokno really wants to have at least fifty percent of the transactions are are digital in nature already. And um, with all the initiatives that are coming in, you know the the QRPH, basically you can facilitate peer-to-peer -peer transfer, uh, payment to merchants and micro-merchants, payment to billers. These are all initiatives to make, you know, uh, to, to facilitate digital transactions. And, and these initiatives are actually inexpensive ways for, for, you know, for the average Filipino to, to be able to do their financial transactions. Because case in point, like the P2M, the typical setup there is you would have a, a terminal. But in this case, QR, you just have your QR there and anyone can pay you already. So I think, you know, the partnership of fintechs, the banks, financial institutions, the regulators, and the service providers is really in play right now. And, you know, in the last two to three years, I could really see the growth of it. It's an exponential growth, you know. Um, and, and you know, with, with the concepts of BSP like open finance or open banking, wherein we are able to share data already uh, so that, you know, we can further democratize, you know, um, information and everyone can. I, I really believe that, you know, we are headed in the right step. I, I think uh, the partnership between the public and private sector is really key here. And, you know, I, I have to give my, my uh, tip my hat of BSP and SEC and UNCIC. You know, they're really, um, they've been very, uh, I wouldn't say liberal, but open-minded in terms of taking in, you know, uh, accepting newer technology to mm -hmm. help in, in, you know, expanding financial inclusion in, in the country. Thank you, Ben. So, ben? Okay, so uh, f final uh, word. So um, what Dennis said is actually absolutely, you know, on point. The way the Philippine economy is going to rise and um, develop, not just because of this pandemic, but I guess in, in the coming decades, is really to transform into a digital economy. There, there's no if and buts. <laughs> it's, it's the only way. Um, Krista mentioned we are a uh, we're an archipelago, and you know it's very hard to reach people physically. So how do you bridge that? It's through technology. Um, consistently, one third, around one third of our workforce is abroad, and remittance is is a very big um, factor. Uh, to their um, to their livelihood and their way the way they can actually uh, sustain their families that are left behind here, and it, you can only do that with technology. I mean, um, funnily enough, uh, abroad everywhere cryptocurrency is about investments, but it actually started off here as a form of remittance, if you could believe that. So um, I could I could speak about all of these factors and conditions in the country, which point to the Philippines becoming a digital economy as really the solution to a lot of our issues. And that's what we are doing um, from government in partnership with the private sector. So for the CIC in particular, um, what, what we are, if you think about it, is we are the government's fintech. We are the GOCC, the corporation that is really about technology Everything we do is about technology. Look at our budget, look at our assets, look at our functions. It is all based on technology. We're not doing this using pen and paper. It's impossible to do it that way. And you know, as the government's fintech, um, we want to be there at the frontier, pushing the boundaries, reducing friction costs, providing um, a seamless way for online lenders to be able to quickly process loan applications based on accurate and reliable information from us. So that's the aspect on the projects and the initiatives. But I do want to touch on something Johnson said, which is about educating the public, because we are providing the supply of innovation services, but the demand has to match it. So we do have initiatives such as CIC Academy, such as our online resources, to educate the public about the benefits of credit reporting as a concept and to also push it to them as something that is easy, 
uh, for them to adopt and embrace. And it's actually going to benefit them meaningfully in their everyday life. So the objective here really is to, as you said earlier, um, resonate with the average Joe. That's what the CIC uh, is doing right now and even into the coming years. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. Sir Johnson? Thank you, Gladys. Uh, prior to this digital age, you know, uh, rural banks are in the forefront of uh, financial inclusion. In fact, uh, we are uh, mandated to go to the unbanked areas physically, even if it's not economical. <laughs> you know, setting up a branch, doing the collections, handling cash, it's too risky for us. That is why even if we would like to go there, to those unbanked areas, if there are no economic activity, that's very, very difficult and uh, uh, a, a wrong business uh, decision. But with the, the trend in technology, digitalization, we may be extinct if we will not embrace these changes in technology or if we will not ride in the bandwagon of digitalization. That is why we in the Rural Bank are, are very keen in uh, how we can uh, adapt these uh, technologies. In fact, just recently, one of our member banks has already joined in the uh, cloud uh, banking, and then recently they, they have launched their uh, mobile banking uh, services. Just like uh, what uh, Sir Dennis said, they have joined the uh, QRPH already so that, that they can provide uh, greater access to financial services. Because eventually what will happen, uh, especially if the uh, proposed bill on digital payments has been uh, passed. No? Everything, every transactions will be digital. So there will be an ecosystem of digital money. So if, if, if you cannot adapt to these uh, changes, then you cannot do business anymore or you will be staying in the economy. So the challenge for us, not only for rural banks, but for all financial technology providers is to really uh, focus on how to improve services by providing greater access and affordable access to financial technologies. Because uh, financial inclusion does not revolve only on credit. It, it, it's also uh, a way of uh, giving them access to formal uh, financial system. And that is what uh, we are really uh, doing. So uh, a lot has, has to be done yet. But uh, I'm sure we are on the right track on uh, uh, financial inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and yes, Crystal? Yeah. Um, on my side, what I wanted to add as kind of closing remarks uh, is that from the one perspective, from societal standpoint, the uh, banking the unbanked is a very, very meaningful tool against poverty, probably the most meaning, meaningful tool against the path of, against poverty. And then uh, the ability to participate in the formal financial uh, system for individuals to be able to uh, securely uh, save uh, their, their current unearned income and through that to also get access to better credit to finance either their personal or their corporate, their small businesses that can eventually turn into bigger businesses. All of these types of endeavors have been kind of uh, in, the, in the core of uh, mankind's growth and prosperity since pretty much we have written history in place. So uh, it's at the same time, it's exciting that the Philippines is right now on the brink of a journey like this. And on the other side, it's... Uh, it's a very big um, boat challenge as well as um, uh, it requires a lot of effort from everyone participating in the financial system in order to be able to address that challenge. For the business, the um, uh, kind of the, the advantages are quite obvious. More banked clients for everyone means better profitability, better, uh, more loans to give, uh, higher approval rates, lower default rates, better access to information, more payments and transaction fees. It's like there is undeniably only advantages from achieving that goal. And um, there is also another pillar to that, the, where the future of money is, which is something that Sir Johnson mentioned and also Dennis uh, referred to earlier. The future of money is digital. 
which means that the tools and the processes that companies are going to engage with also have to be digital. Undeniably, whether it's going to be e-wallets like Gcash and Paymaya, whether it's going to be payment processors like Paymongo, whether it's going to be companies like Finscore that are kind of trying to glue different uh, information providers or different data sources together, uh, that's uh, an undeniable fact that has to be taken into the same context. And it's very exciting to be able to, to play a role in that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Yes, that is. Thank you for moderating this uh, amazing session. Also appreciate uh, the insights uh, from our panelists, Dennis, uh, Ben, Johnson, and of course, uh, Crystal. So uh, moving forward for our uh, audience who still have questions, um, please do um, connect with them directly in this platform. Also kindly do take time to visit the virtual exhibition area today where you can see our sponsors, products, and services. Stay tuned for our next session from Amihan Global Strategy. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm.